I'm going to say something that totally is controversial. I haven't said this on any other podcast, so you guys are like... Let's hear it. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are the lucky ones. Um, we debated putting this in the book and we decided not to. Hmm. But when you look at peer-reviewed studies, so academic studies on women's orgasm, women in same-sex relationships orgasm as often as men in heterosexual relationships. Women are just as capable of orgasm as men are. But I just think that there's this misconception that women are not as orgasmic as men because it's actually been shown that we are. It's just that there's this disconnect um, when men and women get together. And I really think a lot of that disconnect, again, goes back to expectations. Hello and welcome to The Naked Gospel, where we have conversations about sex, singleness, marriage, pornography, and everything in between. We bring on cultural thinkers, parents, important folk, and normal folk alike. I am your host, Shane O'Neill. If you're listening in, video versions of all of these episodes are available at YouTube, uh, Proven Ministries, we have that below. If you're watching you just rather listen in, then all of these episodes are available on every major podcast platform. Whether you're listening or watching, do subscribe and continue to track with us. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the episode. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining us again. We are having Sheila Ray Gregoire. I've been practicing the name, Sheila Ray Gregoire on again. She joined us a few months ago to talk to us about the orgasm gap. Uh, today we want to look at sexual integrity within marriage because I didn't get married till I was 30 and I spent m most of my singleness thinking that sexual integrity only applied to singleness, uh, which allowed all sorts of kind of deviant narratives into my head like uh, my pornography addiction would go away once I got married or mm -hmm. that, uh, that marriage would satisfy me and fulfill me in all the ways that I want it to. And, uh, fortunately, was really able to get a grip on pornography long before I got married, but some of those narratives have persisted and I see them in the community around us and the culture around us. So we want to take some time uh, with Sheila today just to process sexual integrity within marriages because when it comes to the sexless, sexless marriage, there are whole statistics done on this and a majority of marriages uh, don't know how to practice sex with, uh, with their mm -hmm. counterpart, with their spouse. Uh, so we want to look at that. Uh, Sheila, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. It's great to be back. Yeah. <laughs> Sheila, would you, uh, just for first time listeners, would you mind just sharing a little bit uh, about who you are? Yeah. So I, ha I'm sort of known as the Christian sex lady, which is really weird because nobody grows up thinking, hey, you know what I really want to do with my life? I want to write about sex and teach people about sex because that's weird. But that's what I've been doing for the last few years. Um, I blog at lovehonorandvacuum.com. I have the Bear Marriage podcast and I've written a number of books on sex. I've written courses like orgasm courses and libido courses. And then most recently, which is what we were talking about last time, um, we surveyed 20,000 women for our mm. most recent book, The Great Sex Rescue, where we looked at the problematic teachings around sex in the evangelical church and how they've really messed up sex for couples, but especially for women. Mm. And how can we recapture what God wanted? Because he sure didn't want us all to have lousy sex. Um, yeah, The Great Sex Rescue has been a huge resource in our local community. It's something that Kaylee and I have worked through. Kaylee's still working through it, which is eliciting a lot of conversation. So for those of you who aren't watching, who are just listening in, Kaylee, my wonderful wife, is joining me today. We did a few podcasts together before we got married, um, just to process singleness and marriage and how we're approaching it. Um, somebody like me who's got a uh, had a porn history and then Kaylee, who's a virgin and just processing those kinds of questions, scenarios and fears. So Kaylee is hanging out with us today. Hey guys. What's up, Kaylee? Yeah. Um, so she's going to be asking questions from time to time. And yeah, just excited. So Sheila, I did the intro talking about sexual integrity within marriage. What are your thoughts about sexual integrity in marriage? Has that been an issue that you've come across as well? I assume it has. You've been writing prolifically yeah. about it, but lo love to hear your thoughts. OK, well, first of all, how many of us grew up hearing the phrase stay pure until you're married? Like, isn't that what we all hear, right? Stay pure until you're married. If I could cancel 
any phrase in the evangelical church, it would be that one because that is such a problematic saying because it implies, think about what that implies. It implies that once you're married, yeah. you're no longer pure, or at least you don't need to worry about this. Like stay pure until you're married implies that something changes once you are married. And mm. we need to stop saying that. We need to just tell people stay pure, period. That's it. Like full stop. We don't need to do any qualifiers because when we say stay pure until you're married, what you're implying is that it is sex, which makes you impure. So, you know, you're, you're staying pure before marriage by not having sex. And then once you are married, you have sex. So now you're not pure anymore and we don't need to worry about it. (laughs) And it's like, that is not what the Bible says about purity at all. You know, first of all, purity is not only about sex. We've reduced it to something that is such a small part of it. But also sex is not a bad thing. (laughs) You know, sex in marriage is a great thing. And so we've added a lot of shame where there shouldn't be. So I think when we talk about this whole idea of sexual integrity in marriage, I really hope that that it can be just a continuation of that conversation of what does sexual integrity look like in general? Um, And, you know, you were talking about how you had to deal with porn as a single guy, which is great, by the way, like kudos to you. but then you thought that in marriage you wouldn't have to. And I, and, and I think part of the problem is that we're defining a biblical sexual ethic as situational. So we're saying that what makes sex good or bad um, is all about whether or not you're married. And that's not really the main point. <laughs> like to me, a biblical sexual ethic is something which says, I am going to honor the person that I'm with and I'm going to treat them with dignity and humanity. And that means before you're married, yeah, you're not going to have sex because you don't want to promise something that you haven't actually promised yet. You know, sex is supposed to be a deeply intimate thing, but it also means that after you're married, you're still doing that same thing. You're still treating the person that you're with, with humanity, with dignity, you're honoring them. Um, And that should be part of our conversation. And that just, we never talk about how to treat our spouse with honor and dignity in sex. It just doesn't seem to come up. No, that's good. Sheila. Kaylee, did you want to, I know you could commiserate some with the purity language and that was something we talked about in the podcast. Do you, did you want to share anything about that? Yeah. Well, I, I just thought it was interesting. Like even as we were talking about with doing like our post dating as we were engaged and um, just kind of this, this term coming up with like, you lost your virginity. Mm-hmm. And for some reason it's more applied to women. I, I feel like, I think I've heard mm-hmm. more women talk about that than men. Um, But even just like the idea of like, I'm giving you my virginity and I continue Mm -hmm. to give you my my Mm -hmm. purity and 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 yes, you are giving um, you're becoming you're giving something that you've never given before. And so it feels different. Um, I think some of what I've like processed a little bit has been, um, yeah, like what what is it is my body. It's just, it's just different. You've never given your body that way. Um, and so, yeah, I really appreciate you, you saying that and just like changing some of the language, um, mm-hmm. so that it doesn't accidentally creep in, in a way that you had no idea that it was there and affecting you, especially mm-hmm. now that you are married and working through some of those things you didn't know were there in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, that, I think that that language is helpful. I, so Sheila, I do want to, so for me, I, I, uh, sex and marriage has effectively freaked me out in a lot of ways, which has been a good thing, but a thing that I, I didn't consider. I I have had premarital sex before, uh, but then all of a sudden sex in marriage feels altogether different because it's so darn intimate. Uh, it's mm-hmm. literally reacting covenant every single time. And that mm-hmm. kind of vulnerability will like just unsettle me in good ways for sure. And it's a thing that Kaylee and I get to continue to dialogue about and work through and practice together. Um, but I, it, it's all of a sudden starts to give me um, imagination for for people who don't really practice sex in marriage. And so just hearing your thoughts mm-hmm. on how important is sex in marriage and even the idea of like practicing sex, like that phrase probably mm-hmm. doesn't even scan for a lot of people, especially single folk with like, no, like, are you kidding me? Like sex is going to be awesome. And 
as you've noted, yeah. the like, purity culture has set us up for that kind of mentality that like, hey, if you save yourself, then God will honor your purity by giving you awesome yeah. sex that all the secular world talk about all the time, but you'll have it the right way. So when it comes to sex yeah. in marriage, how important is it? And talk to us about even like kind of the idea of the practice of sexual intimacy within marriage. I think sex is vitally important but again, it depends how we define it. And I think this is what we were talking about last time too on the show is, you know, sex is something which is intimate, pleasurable, and mutual. So it's about both people, which means that both people have to matter. And sex is not just one-sided intercourse, or it's not just the acts that you do. And I think where the trouble comes is that both partners can mistakenly see sex as mostly a physical thing that we get to do. So, you know, you're married and now you have to do these certain acts or else you're depriving them or the marriage isn't real or whatever, whatever, whatever. And sex becomes about those acts. And when that happens, that can be a highly depersonalizing thing. Like, I love what you said about how sex is vulnerable in a way that you never realized it was supposed to be. That is what it is. That's what it's supposed to be. And yet it's not vulnerable if you're going into sex, just trying to get what you're owed. Like if you're approaching sex, like this is something which you need to give to me, then it's not a vulnerable thing. And so when we say like, is sex vital for marriage? I would say, yes, it is. But sex in a particular way, not just the certain acts. Mm. And that's where we can get really messed up. Yeah. Because when we talk about how it is so important to do these particular acts, we can actually make sex worse for both partners. And it can actually be quite traumatizing, especially for women, if it's reduced to something where it's simply something that she owes and it isn't about her fundamental need. Mm. Um, so that's where that whole conversation, that's where you need to learn how to talk each other's sexual language as you're first married and really, you know, try to figure out what, what, how, what each other likes in terms of what feels good, but also, you know, how that person feels cherished and how that person feels known and seen in, in the bedroom is so vitally important too. Yeah. I, I like that. How, um, I guess if we get into the particularities, what would you say? Cause I've, I've noted some observations of things that I've seen that have inhibited, uh, sex within marriage what would you say are some top things that you've observed uh because you've i mean like the last time we had you on was for the orgasm gap as i said and it's like a survey of like some twenty thousand women and you've mm -hmm. done a survey with several thousand men um mm -hmm. so what are some of you, your findings when it comes to things that have been inhibitors for sexual intimacy within sex? What are some of the, the things that have wedged in marriage? Yeah, I think there's a bunch. I won't talk about like making her feel good because if you want to hear about that, go listen to the last podcast. Okay. So, so go listen to the one on the orgasm gap because it was important. Mm. But I do think this expectations play a huge role. And I don't mean necessarily just expectations about what your sex life will look like, but expectations about what sex is in general. Um, and part of the orgasm gap plays into this and in that we assume that sex is about intercourse. And so then if she doesn't like it, she must not be sexual. And then she she starts to feel broken if she doesn't like it. But that expectation also relates to libido um, because I think we have a fundamental misunderstanding of libido and this can put couples on a really negative spiral um, from the very beginning. And what it looks like is this. So we're taught from time immemorial that sex is a need that men have, right? Like men, guys need sex. They're going to want sex. This is absolutely vital. And so we think that that's what libido looks like, that he gets this idea in his head or some other body part, and now he wants it. And so she has to catch up or she has to do something because his libido is what is sexual. And so that is, becomes the standard. Now, the problem is that not all guys have that kind of libido and also some women do, but most women don't. And so this idea starts to form that he's the one that's sexual and she's the one that isn't. And so they have, you know, he, he has to feel like he's always imposing on her if he wants sex and she feels like this isn't something that's for me. 
And it comes down to a misunderstanding of how libido works for a lot of people. Okay. And I don't know if I talked about this in the last podcast, but um, if you watch any movie, TV show, whatever, the plot when it comes to sex is always the same, right? So the couple's panting Mm -hmm. and they start to kiss and then the clothes come off and they end up in bed, right? Like that's what it is. It's pants. You know, you're panting, you're kissing clothes and then bed. So pant, kiss, clothes, bed, that's libido. And a lot of us are at home and we're waiting to pant and nothing's happening. And so we figure, I guess I don't like sex. And what we don't realize is that for a lot of people, they actually do like sex. They really do enjoy sex. They're very sexually responsive. They can have an orgasm, but they just don't have that felt need in the same way. So for a lot of people, it doesn't look like pant, kiss, close bed. It might look like, you know, um, bed, kiss, close pant, right? You get into bed, you start snuggling, you start kissing, then the nightgown comes off. And only then do you start to pant. Only then do you get it all excited or aroused. And there's nothing wrong with that. And some guys are like that too. So a lot of women get married and their husband is not begging for it all the time. And they think he's just not sexual. He doesn't like me. He doesn't want me. And it's not true. It's just, he's more responsive. So some people have more of a spontaneous libido and some people have more of a, spo- of a responsive libido, but they're both libido. If you're both enjoying sex when it happens, and if you're both having orgasms, you're doing great. So the question is, isn't, you know, my, does my spouse not want me because they're not spontaneous? It's how do I understand how to help my wife or my husband respond? And I'm interested mm-hmm. instead of viewing each other as one person is sexual and one person isn't. Mm-hmm. No, that's helpful. All of that is helpful. Um, I do want to ask Sheila, what is, um, uh, what is the prioritization of how should people properly prioritize? So even that, I don't even know how to ask the question, the place of orgasm in sex. So in one sense, you want to say that like sex isn't just about an orgasm. While on the other side, mm-hmm. it was like, well, there's a disparity. We, we use maybe mm-hmm. that, that sentence then to justify, I, I think your statistics were something like 96% of men orgasm mm-hmm. during sex and like 47% of women do. And so mm-hmm. there is a... Uh, an imbalance, a, a, a relational imbalance that's taking place in intimacy there. Um, so there's there's that, but then there's also this other, you know, they're like like some women don't orgasm from vaginal sex. Um, some mm-hmm. guys, uh, you know, like guys will be more aroused in the morning, women more aroused at night. Some women can't mm-hmm. even get off in the morning if they have morning sex. Um, mm-hmm. So then it's like, okay, like is it is it always egalitarian in the sex of like kind of a, an exchange at that, at that level, or what is, what does it look like to be one with one another and the place of orgasm in that? Yeah, that is such a tricky question. And I've always, I, this is something that we, we wrestle with like as part of my team on the blog of how to address it, because when you say, you know, don't pressure yourselves because pressure makes orgasm less likely anyway, That can actually feed part of the problem, which is that the reason that a lot of women don't orgasm is because they don't think they have a right to or that it's not important. And so it's like, how do you, yeah, exactly. It's like, how, how do you find that balance between making sure that her orgasm is important, but also not pressuring everybody all the time because it can backfire. Um, I'm going to say something that totally is controversial. I haven't said this on any other podcast. So you guys are like, let's hear it. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are the lucky ones. Um, we debated putting this in the book and we decided not to, mm. but when you look at peer reviewed studies, so academic studies on women's orgasm, women in same sex relationships, orgasm is often as men in heterosexual relationships. Okay. Women are just as capable of orgasm as men are. It's not that women aren't orgasmic. It's that in heterosexual relationships, which of course is what I want. And, you know, I'm all for that in marriages, et cetera. Like that's, that's what my whole thing is, is helping women in heterosexual marriages figure this out. But I just think that there's this misconception that women are not as orgasmic as men because it's actually been shown that we are. It's just that there's this disconnect um, when men and women get together. And I really think a lot of that disconnect, again, goes back to expectations in that um, 
we don't think that her orgasm is as important as his. And so from the very beginning, we do it wrong. And what I always tell people is like, I would teach, I would, I would treat a couple that's been married for 20 years where she's been struggling with orgasm very differently from a newlywed couple like you guys. Because when you've been married for 20 years, the last thing you need is pressure. You've been worried about this for 20 years, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, how do you overcome that? Um, how do you learn? How do you go backwards and try to learn arousal and all of that stuff? But I tell newlyweds, go for it. Just go for it. Because <laughs> if you can figure this out now, <laughs> you're putting yourself on such a better trajectory. Mm. You know? Yeah. I'm, Just play. Yeah. Yeah. Play. Yeah. Sex mm-hmm. as play isn't uh, it's such a, a a gentle language and it's not a language that yeah. I was ever grown up is like, you know, sex as consuming sex as voracious, you know, is very aggressive. Yeah. But sex as play is very innocent and, and childlike without being childish, I think. Yeah. Let me ask one more question. Then Kaylee can, has a few questions that she wants to ask as well. Um, Sheila, in in your um in your book, The Great Sex Rescue, there's a chapter and it talks about how your spouse is not your methadone. Um, mm-hmm. And this will tee up for, for Kaylee's, one of Kaylee's questions. But um, I, I want to press into that, not in, a, not in an aggressive way at all, but I want to press into it. Uh, what, what should be happening in that kind of situation? So there's kind of like a, a negative vision of sexual, sexual ethics and sexual integrity of like do's and don'ts. Um, whereas mm-hmm, there's the kind of mm-hmm. a positive vision of like partnership and union. And so I get the, I get the idea and I think it's strong language and I think it's appropriately strong language of your, your spouse is not your methadone. Like you're, in other words, uh, as you're getting off of the substance, as you're getting off porn, um, don't use your wife's vagina as a kind mm-hmm. of catch all for sexual mm-hmm. pleasure while you're withdrawing and detoxing off of your porn addiction. Um, while at the same time, uh, the, the question arises out of that of where is where is sexual intimacy in that process? Um, mm-hmm. What is the kind of like because then that makes me think of kind of a do's and don'ts like a don't like, OK, like get through this so that you can prove that you're suited for your spouse uh, mm-hmm. and then you guys can start being intimate again. Where is the place of intimacy when when the husband's trying to trying to find trying to find satisfaction in his spouse instead of through pixels or some mm-hmm. kind of digital mistress. I think first we need to confront the fact that sex and porn are polar opposites. Mm-hmm. And that's why sex can't be a replacement for porn and until sex is seen as something which is the polar opposite of porn you're not going to be able to develop a healthy sex life in marriage. And that's, that's the problem that a lot of couples come into because what's what porn says is I'm going to use you for my gratification. And what sex says is I'm going to be vulnerable and intimate with you and really know you on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. And you can't know someone when you're using them and you can't be vulnerable with someone when you're trying to cover up shame which is what a lot of porn is. So that's why a lot of counselors who work with, with couples that are going through um, these issues recommend like a 90 day sex fast. Um, I'm not saying every couple needs to do that. I think it's highly individual. And I think going with a licensed counselor who knows something about sex addictions um, is really important once you're married, if that's an issue in your marriage. Um, but I think that's the fundamental problem. When we, when you look at the verse in first Corinthians seven about, you know, do not deprive except for a time and then come together again so that you won't be tempted by your lack of self-control. It wasn't, it, it was written in such a different context than we read it. Paul was writing that um, to Christians who were vowing celibacy because it was seen as, as being more spiritual to vow celibacy than it was to have sex in your marriage. And he was saying, Hey guys, like, let's stop with the celibacy stuff. Um, (laughs) you know, because people would vow celibacy and then they would be overwhelmed by these feelings and they would fall and they would see that as a negative thing. And he's like, just stop that. There's no, like, there's no extra brownie points in being celibate once you're married, like don't Mm -hmm. deprive each other. And that's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about using your spouse to cure an addiction. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where we need to see these things as slightly different. So there's a big difference between saying, 
you know, when you have a healthy sex life in marriage, you're going to find a lot of normal problems in life are just easier to handle. Like they really are. When you have a good sex life, you don't get annoyed when people cut you off when you're on the highway as much, you know, you, you, you smile at people in line more. You're just a, you know, you're just a better person in general because <laughs> your attention levels down, you feel good. And, and that's going to overflow in every area of your life. And so, yes, you're going to find other things which might normally tempt you less tempting, but that's not the same as saying that a sex life is going to cure an actual addiction. So it's one thing to say, a good sex life is going to just help you with the normal issues of life. It's quite another thing to say that a sex life is going to, is going to stop the addiction because Paul is so adamant in his letters that the person who is dealing with a sexual problem needs to be the one dealing with sexual problem <laughs> that you don't put that on someone else. So that's where I really think when there is a porn or sex addiction, the root needs to be dealt with first. And you're really never, ever going to be able to enjoy a proper sex life until that root is dealt with. No, that's that's worth saying, because the studies show like all of the studies show that pornography doesn't uh, doesn't. They don't they used to use the language of hijack the libido. Now they're pretty forward in saying it actually replaces your libido. Mm -hmm. It's not so yeah. much that you are sex crazed, you're porn crazed, you know, it's. Yep. And they did this through like studies in Las Vegas where there'd be like these porn conventions with thousands of people. But like two blocks away, there'd be prostitutes on the streets. But like business would be very slow for the prostitutes because everyone wanted to go to the porn convention. Because people weren't yeah. addicted to sex. They were addicted to porn. Right. Yep. So I, I think that's 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 really helpful. Um, go ahead. Uh, they, they're just like leaping off off of what you just said as like the person you say, you know, the person working through the addiction needs to be working through the addiction before they try and like use their spouse. Um, mm -hmm. But what does it look like for, you know, the spouse who is um, not the one recovering from the porn addiction and you do have a, a libido um, mm -hmm. and you do want to have sex with your husband, with your wife. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. what does it look like to be, f to be, well, to be pure, kind of like you were saying, obviously mm -hmm. we're not like, okay, let's go out and find another sexual partner until mm -hmm. my husband gets together, my wife gets together. Right. But like, mm -hmm. what does that look like to, um, you know, during that 90 day fast? What is it, how do, how do you process that as the, and be a, even a good support? Um, how do you help yeah. take care of yourself and how do you be a good support to your spouse um, in that time? Question. Yeah, again, I'm not saying that everyone needs to do a 90 day fast. If you want to find out about it, Terry Crews, you know, from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, like the actor, he's awesome. Anyway, Terry and his wife, Rebecca, have talked about this, that you can look up their videos on YouTube. And he's just been such a great person talking about this. I'm really happy he's doing that. Um, I don't mean talking about the 90 day fast, but just talking about porn addictions in general and how it really sucked him in. Um, I really think if you're going through this and if you want to try a 90 day fast, you really need to do it with the counselor. Like, like. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not telling anyone to fix this yourself, whether that's the end all and be all. A lot of counselors don't even agree with them. Some think 30 days is okay. Like, so again, see a counselor. This is not me giving any prescription for that. Um, but whatever you do, whether it's 30 days, 90 days, whether you don't do fast, whatever you do with this counselor, I, I would say to the, to the um, other spouse that this sucks. Like, like, Knowledge like it. seriously, this is yeah. really bad and it's not fair. And yeah, you're going to be frustrated and you're going to, you're going to feel betrayed and angry that you're frustrated and everything. But in all things, it's really important to keep the end goal in mind. And the end goal is really learning how to be intimate as a couple. Um, and for most people, that intimacy has to start with emotional and spiritual intimacy, not with sexual intimacy. And most people who are sex addicts have never actually learned how to be emotionally intimate. And so if you're married to someone who'd had a sex addiction, it's very likely that you've never honestly known them. You may, you may have felt close. You may have felt like you were in love, but it's quite likely that you never really truly knew their inmost fears, their inmost shame, um, the things that they were hiding with porn, you know, because 
poor, well, I love what Michael John Cusick says um, in his book, Surfing for God, which is an excellent book about getting over sex addictions too, is like porn allows you to feel strong without having to be strong. You know, it allows you to feel like a man without having to act like a man. And so a lot of people, a lot of guys, especially who are struggling with identity and what it means to be a man and just feeling a lot of shame in their life for all kinds of different reasons will go to porn because it masks the shame. It allows them to feel like I'm, I've got it all together without having to have it all together. And so quite often, no one has seen what they're really dealing with in their life. No one's actually seen behind the curtain. And so part of the healing process is helping them to let you see behind the curtain. Mm. And even though it's frustrating for you, that's such an important process to go through for your marriage overall. Um, and I think focusing on that end goal um, is really important. And again, doing that with a counselor, but yeah, it's just, it's lousy. It's lousy, but hopefully at the end of it, you're going to feel like you really know each other in a way that you didn't before. That's a good question. Kaylee, do you have a follow-up? I, I want to honor our time, so I have one more question. If you have one more, you can ask it, or I can just jump into the last one. Go for it. All right. Um, Sheila, what is, um, I, uh, for lack of a better term, what's the ideal here? Um, what What is kind of your shtick? So you spoke last time you were here. Um, you talk about You talked about uh, the danger of a lot of our kind of sexual ethics of like, turning like men away from women as opposed to actually rightly mm -hmm. seeing them. And if you'd be willing mm -hmm. just to reiterate to that vision, it, I think it, it goes both ways. Um, but man, that, that vision is worth communicating because a lot of people can get pieces of it, but like seeing mm -hmm. the overarching, I mean, we even talked last time about, you know, like how uh, kind of sex talk in, in pornography is kind of a, Pardon mm -hmm. the language, but a bastardized version of like honest communication during sex, you know, like it is a lot mm -hmm. of r like really wholesome things that are just warped and perverted in a really gnarly context. And so what is kind of the ideal here that you're hoping to give marriages, men and women? OK, this is going to sound weird, but did you ever read the Narnia series? Yeah. C.S. Lewis. OK, you know, when um, Lucy well, well, the children are asking the beavers to explain Aslan and they say, well, he's not a tame lion, you know, mm. right? Like he's not a tame lion. And I think that's such a picture of God. Like he's not tame, he's wild and he's passionate. And that is what God made orgasm to be. It's something mm. where you lose control. You literally lose control right? Like you can't, and, and you also have to be highly vulnerable, especially for women. It's very difficult to even orgasm if you're trying to orgasm. Like if you're trying to stay in control, if you're hyper aware of what's going on, if you're worrying about whether you're doing it right, it's very unlikely you're going to get there. So orgasm requires this huge letting go, this huge amount of trust. And then you actually are a little bit out of control. And isn't that what our relationship with God is supposed to look like, right? Like we're totally letting go. <laughs> we're not worried about what we look like. We're able to completely trust him and be ourselves. And then in that moment of deep intimacy with him, we feel out of control, you know, mm -hmm. because we're passing it on to him. We don't need to micromanage everything, you know? Yeah. That is why God created orgasm, I think, as a picture, as this, as this deep experience that mirrors what we're supposed to be with him. And so I think with sex, it's this picture of this deep passion that flows from truly knowing and trusting someone. And so it's not something that's neat and clean, you know, it's something that's messy. It's something that isn't tame. <laughs> it's something that is going to go in strange directions that you weren't expecting. You can't plan it always. It's going to surprise you, but that's the beauty of it that you get to experience together. And the problem is that a lot of us are accepting something, which is a very cheap imitation. And 
we're taking out the part about truly letting go and about truly knowing each other and trusting each other. And we're substituting just the physical aspects of what we're doing. Um, and I think as we're able to really maintain our sexual integrity, right? So to get rid of anything that's keeping us back from sex um, in a pure way, in a, in a wholesome, good, passionate way. Um, and as we're able to get away from a lot of the shame filled messages that so many of us were given about sex, then we're going to really be able to fly, but it does necessitate just saying, how am I seeing this and what's holding me back? Mm -hmm. You know, and is the way that we're going, is it bringing us closer to intimacy or is it bringing us away from intimacy? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just think that sex is this beautiful picture that God has for us of how we can truly see and experience each other. And I think it's really warped in evangelical circles. Um, and we're missing out on what real passion and real intimacy is. And I hope that we can capture that vision a bit again. I love all of that. Um, Sheila, uh, we always end with uh, how can people track with you um, mm -hmm. and the stuff you're putting out there? And how can people be praying for you? Yeah. So um, again, everything is at to love, honor, and vacuum.com. You can find the links to our books there, including the great sex rescue, which I'm honestly hoping that goes big. It's been selling really well. People have told, it's got amazing reviews on Amazon. If you want to go take a look, like people are just saying, this is the book that we always needed. So that's been mm -hmm. really encouraging for us. Um, give it to your counselors, give it to your pastors um, so that we can get the word out because there's a lot of really bad information in the evangelical world about sex. Um, but yeah, everything's at tolovehonorandvacuum.com. We've got our courses there too, orgasm course. Um, uh, our podcast is there. Uh, so yeah, go take a look there, my social media links and everything. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prayer? Yeah, sure. No, no. Would you, is there any, how would you like listeners to be praying oh, for Oh, how you? would you like me to pray? Oh, you know what? Yeah. Um, we just have, so we did this huge survey for the Great Sex Rescue and we followed up with another huge survey of women asking how their um, experiences as teens in the church have affected them today because we want to write a mother-daughter book and we're just facing a lot of deadlines and I'm just tired and I'm about to have a grandbaby. And so <laughs> it's just for focus. Yeah. I just need to yeah, focus. Yeah. <laughs> I did like your response when I asked prayer. Your response was yes, sure. Like <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. We will we will totally be with you in that. And thank you so much for taking time to join us today and just letting you letting us ask you questions. One of the things that uh I've enjoyed and some of the responses we've gotten were you know, these are the conversations we wish we could have had when we were younger and we're so grateful mm -hmm. that we get to have them now. So thank you for mm -hmm. stepping into these spaces with us. It's a uh, it's very Big sister esque, and we just really grateful for you and willing mm -hmm. to have these conversations because, you know, we've treated them as kind of sacrosanct and so so holy that we dare not ever talk about them. And for you, it's like yeah. we're still, well, they're so holy we should obviously talk about them. You know, so yeah. thank you for having these conversations with us. Yeah, thanks for well, thank that. you, and congratulations on your marriage and being newlyweds. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. An adventure. Yes. It is. It is. Yeah. So thank you for helping us on that. Um, <laughs> folks, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, share it with somebody you think would benefit from it. Uh, as always, if you want to support this show, check out the Disruptor Initiative down below. Uh, it helps you, well, allows you to shape who we have on, the questions we ask, and you get sweet stuff like this naked gospel coffee mug. Um, yeah, we're just grateful for all of you. Continue to let us know who you want us to interview, who you want us to have on, and the questions you want us to ask. And Kaylee, Sheila, you both have been lovely. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>